Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third session in our four-week speaker series on the capitalist mode of power. This week, I'm honored to introduce to you my good friend and esteemed colleague, James McMahon. Uh, James is a PhD student in York's graduate program in social and political thought. His current research focuses on risk, creativity, and the political economy of the Hollywood film business. James has already produced path-breaking work in this er area, uh, some of which has recently been published in the Review of Capital as Power. Uh, James will uh, speak for approximately one hour, thus giving us plenty of time for a question and answer session to follow. James. Thank you very much, Joseph. So in 2001, PBS Frontline uh, produced a documentary called The Monster That Ate Hollywood. This documentary interviewed studio executives, journalists, and some actors. Probably the most famous one in the bunch would be Michael Douglas to, to help answer questions like these. How do today's Hollywood pictures get made? Why do they get made? Who makes the decisions? And why are so many big budget Hollywood movies so disappointing? Have risk averse conglomerates squelched Hollywood's creativity? The interviews were published online, and overall, you could say that they were pessimistic in tone. In fact, even if the interviewees were from different parts of the film business, they all seemed to share in the same pessimism. We can summarize this pessimism with, I guess, three points. So first, and this includes studio executives, everyone that was interviewed seemed to be able to point to, uh, or at least to acknowledge, that contemporary movies were, in fact, either simpler, more repetitive, or even unoriginal. So one studio uh, executive, for example, was complaining about how Hollywood narrative structure is sort of attached on to a story, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. So you have a movie for 75% of the film. It seems that it's going in a sort of a depressing, pessimistic uh, sort of tone. But the uh, sort of the cliche, happy Hollywood ending sort of gets tacked onto it regardless of whether it actually makes sense for these characters to either reconcile or to save the day. The second, it seemed that everyone was able to also point to who they felt to be were the actual culprits. So some were talking about this sort of wave of media conglomeration. And if they weren't talking about media conglomeration, they were talking about big corporations, saying that now Hollywood is this big giant that has an interest not just in making movies, but in making t-shirts and theme parks and all sorts of other things. And if it wasn't, if they weren't really talking about corporate structure, uh, some of the interviews were just sort of saying that, well, there's just a new type of person in Hollywood. There's the financial accountant. There's the business person that's at a set of meetings now. And these are the, these are the type of people that are now making decisions over which movies get made. Now, third, uh, this pessimism was also sort of reflected through a form of nostalgia nostalgia for the past. So looking back at an older form of Hollywood, they, uh, many of the interviews would say, back in the day, Hollywood used to be a smaller town. We used to make business deals over lunch or at parties. Uh, that doesn't seem to uh, happen uh, anymore. Not only that, if you look back, it seemed that people used to want to make both money and art. And now, obviously, I guess in this pessimism, it's just about money. And the sort of the, the decade that is, was often referred to was the 1960s to the 1970s, which some film historians would consider to be Hollywood's last uh, golden age. Now, overall, one of the takeaways of the frontline interviews is that contemporary Hollywood is risk averse. But what does this actually mean? And unfortunately, I would say that this is the limitations of the PBS investigations. The interviews, the interviews seemed to rehearse the same narrative about the history of Hollywood cinema, but they were leaving more significant questions dangling in the air. Some of the questions that I can think of are, why is there a business interest for simpler films? Do capitalists want Hollywood to remain unoriginal and repetitive? If the 1960s and 1970s were so great for both money and art, why won't Hollywood return to that style of filmmaking? Is there a creative recession in Hollywood? Would Hollywood, in fact, go another way if it had the right creative talent? If it could actually maybe hire better writers or better directors, would it, in fact, maybe sort of have a, a, a sort of a new wave of Hollywood? 
Today I would like to try to connect some of these dots. What I want to do is try to understand why contemporary Hollywood cinema has a distinct aesthetic tendency, one that makes some of us complain, I've seen this movie a thousand times. In order to have a better understanding of the political economy of Hollywood, I will be analyzing and empirically investigating risk. We will analyze risk to figure out why the control of creativity is central to the Hollywood film business. We will empirically investigate risk to know if the control of creativity is benefiting what I am calling major filmed entertainment, the six largest distributors in Hollywood, or what is commonly known as the major Hollywood studios. So today, my presentation is going to be broken down into four parts. The first two will be more conceptual, and the second half of the presentation will be more empirical. So <coughs> with respect to the conceptual <coughs> aspect of my presentation, in the first part, we're going to maybe start with a go uh, start with a critique. By looking at the sort of the common way that risk is often used in academic literature, we will then start to see, well, maybe there's a problem here, and we may, may actually have to think about the relationship between risk and power more significantly. If we then know that that's the case, we'll move to the second part, which is risk and capitalist power. This isn't going to go over the technical details of the capitalist power approach, but it will at least start to help us think that this is maybe what we need to think about. We may actually need to be looking at risk when it comes to looking at Hollywood. Now, the second half will be more empirical. So one of the tasks in that part of the presentation will just to try to find, a, to find a way to have some sort of understanding of the level of Hollywood's risk. So if we see that there's a point to look at risk, we need to ask ourselves, well, is risk going up, down? Is it going sideways? If we don't really know that, we're sort of left kind of uh, with a theoretical idea that may have very little shape after that. Then in the fourth part, I will go into one example which I uh, have presented before, but it's going to be looking into saturation booking, which is a strategy of major filmed entertainment. And I'm going to present uh, some data on that to, make sure, uh, to demonstrate that this has something to do with the historical development of risk in the Hollywood film business. So, um, a power-free Hollywood. Aside from being virtually absent from Marxist political economy, it is not difficult to find mainstream literature on risk and the Hollywood film business. Like the PBS documentary, economists and business historians keep referring to Hollywood as a risky business. Risk, as it is commonly understood, exists in the Hollywood film business because firms can only do so much in the face of what is assumed to be the social world of cinema that is beyond the reaches of power. To many, this characterization of Hollywood, of, cinema, uh, of Hollywood cinema is not a problem. In fact, the point is to corroborate a power-free economics of the Hollywood film business, where popular culture is a so-called free realm for autonomous consumption, or where advertisements simply tell us what movies are available and we vote for the best films with our dollars. An analysis of power cannot let these problematic assumptions lie undisturbed. An assumption like consumer sovereignty perpetuates a power-free economics, which stops us from even starting to think of how risk might have an observable relationship with exercises of capitalist power. So let me just briefly expand on this argument. Much of the academic literature on the Hollywood film business moves from the particular to the universal. Its general conclusions about risk are drawn out of its empirical analyses that focus on one or many risk reduction strategies. By making risk reduction strategies its primary concern, mainstream academic literature turns filmmaking into a production function, and from there, the debate is about whether certain techniques are effective. Famous movie stars with their perceived ability to draw consumers to some movies rather than others are most commonly analyzed as being factors of, of production that are employed to reduce the financial risks of Hollywood cinema. Now, I would say that the problem uh, overall with uh, this sort of approach is that they say actually very little about the historical development of risk, or to put it another way, what some people would actually call systemic risk. In fact, the possibility for risk perceptions to significantly change over time is out of place in studies that also assume <coughs> 
so-called economic actors are too small to change the historical circumstances of risk. So with this sort of simple visualization, consumer sovereignty is its own sort of thing, and it exists uh, sort of separately from a Hollywood studio, and it seems to just be this large amorphous blob. In the mainstream literature, risk reduction strategies like using movie stars or making blockbuster movies, no matter how effective, never transform the business environment itself. In part because its monopolistic character is downplayed or even ignored, the Hollywood film business as a whole is seen to have an inherent level of risk that remains in spite of any, any strategy. So uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of assumption is actually carried into uh, the, uh, much of the literature on risk in the Hollywood film business, and when that is the case, when, it starts, when some of this literature starts to ask a question of, well, what can the studio actually do with respect to making predictions about its films, the answer is really that it can actually do nothing. And there was a screenwriter called William Goldman who in one of his books famously said that when it comes to the business of Hollywood cinema, nobody knows anything. This sort of assumption in consumer sovereignty is actually taken up, is actually taken up in the literature as a way to say when it comes to actually even analyzing risk, uh, or even when it comes to even understanding risk, nobody knows anything and you can't actually really do anything. So uh, for uh, try, I'll read it, um, but please just maybe try to ignore some of, the, uh, some of the jargony language. But this is Arthur Devaney from Hollywood Economics, how extreme uncertainty shapes the film industry. So what Devaney does in his book is that he uses uh, he carries a set of assumptions, but he uses uh, his form of statistical modeling to say that revenue forecasts have zero precision, which is just a way of saying that anything can happen. The nobody knows principle is revealed in the infinite variance and scale-free form of the probability distribution. When the probability distribution is scale-free, it has no characteristic size and there is no typical movie. If variance is infinite, the prediction is impossible. One can only say that the expected revenue of a movie is x plus or minus infinity. So in other words, by this existence of consumer sovereignty, by this fact that the social world of, son uh, social world of cinema is an autonomous entity separate from the film business itself, making any sort of prediction about what people will actually do on the weekends or what they'll do with their money when they go see a movie is frankly impossible according to this sort of version. So the idea that the expected revenue of a movie is plus or minus infinity, obviously infinity makes that just an impossible prediction. So we can actually represent uh, these neoclassical assumptions visually. So this is in figure one, which is included in the chart book. So what I'm doing here is that this is just simple. It's a, a ratio of the number of theatrical releases in the United States. Uh, to the U.S. theatrical attendance per capita. In other words, how many movies do you on average see in the year? And in that year, how many movies are actually available, technically, for you to see? Now, in my mind, there's a whole bunch of problematic assumptions for this figure really to mean anything. But really, that's, in this sense, this is the point. So obviously, I've titled it, If the World of Cinema Was Flat. So let's sort of just proceed on the assumption that consumer sovereignty, in fact, did rule the day. If that was the case, uh, and major film and entertainment was passive with respect to the social relations of cinema, this tells us a story not only of risk, but possibly of even increasing risk over time. So figure one not only tells us that too, mo too many movies are being made in comparison to attendance per capita, but risk may be increasing if more movies are made available for consumers who have the freedom to be fickle. So if a, if, a, if a consumer technically always has that freedom to be fickle or to be arbitrary or to even be random or chaotic, really the, the sort of increase in the, in the choice, theoretically, would obviously sort of possibly increase this idea that there's more risk in the Hollywood film business. And it seems that in our recent period that uh, free choice, if that's the case, is at an all-time high. We actually have technically an, more, avail more movies that we actually uh, more to see. So uh, 
what I want to do is start to create, uh, or at least start to look into uh, trying to understand an alternative. Uh, for those that are curious about this picture, this is from a comment card from Universal Pictures for David Cronenberg's Videodrome. And the question was, what did you especially dislike or would like changed in the movie? And the person in the audience just put sucked. Um, so to start to think of an alternative uh, using the capitalist power approach, we can start with another visual, which is uh, actually even more simpler than uh, figure two, but I think is actually, in fact, uh, more powerful. So figure two sim simply shows us US attendance per capita. So all this is showing is the sort of the average movie going habits of an American of how many movies or how many viewings of a, a movie in theaters they see each year. So as we can see from 1960 all the way up until 2011, it's sort of plateaued around five viewings or five movies, if you're assuming that they're seeing five different movies. So you could make the argument that Hollywood is trying to push for people to see more movies, but there actually, in fact, may be another strategy, one which relates to risk, or as another way to put it, as the volatility of moving going habits. So if figure one sort of carried the problematic assumption that, free, that choice is at an all-time high, looking at this figure, we may start to get a better idea of what Hollywood is in fact trying to do. So if the average American is seeing about five films per year, the goal of major filmed entertainment may be to actually influence and control choice and try to determine which five movies you in fact see. Because if the level itself is not going up, and that could be for a number of reasons, Hollywood may be saying, well, if we actually can't get people to see more movies, we may as well sort of change our strategy and just make sure we can determine with a better deg degree of certainty which movies you're actually going to see. So for example, there may be an advantage in knowing with a greater degree of certainty that moviegoers will only see blockbusters released by the major studios. Now, with this uh, sort of uh, this sort of way of looking at the Hollywood film business, you can also even sort of represent it sort of visually. Um, now, this is just obviously a simple uh, sort of vis visualization of what I'm trying to think about. But in this case, there's a more of an explicit understanding that power can, in fact, shape and create the social relations of cinema. That the social world of cinema, the way that we talk about movies, the way that we see movies, um, is not, in fact, this autonomous realm that is separate from firms that are so-called too small or too weak to do anything about it. In this case, it seems that capitalist power may, in fact, be able to, may be able to put limits on the social world of cinema. And by putting limits on that world, you can actually create some sort of determin determinacy, where, in a crazy way, the social world of cinema may actually have its own sort of trajectory where a capitalist can actually see, I know where this social world is actually going or how it's going to actually move. So this is a work in progress, but taking that idea, we can actually break down the five films per capita average, which was in figure two. So this is uh, figure three, which is looking at the franchise phenomenon, which is often critiqued as an example of Hollywood's unoriginality. So, Figure three already gives us a better idea of what we may already know intuitively, which is that people tend to watch a lot of franchise films. But interestingly, figure three tells us that the general habit of watching franchises is getting stronger as the proportion of franchise films is roughly staying at the same level, before, below 5% of all films released each year. So they're not in proportion to all the movies that are available to you, they're not making more franchise films, but there may actually be a, fact where, a, a situation where, in fact, people are gravitating more to franchise films than anything else. So figure three can actually be corroborated if we ask ourselves another question. What are Americans not watching? So figure four is similar to figure three, but it shows us the movie franchise habit as attendance per capita. It also shows us foreign language films, which is also expressed as attendance per capita. Now, the difference, in my opinion, is stark. So if on average you see five films in theaters each year, if you actually go see one, just one foreign language film, 
you are a very rare moviegoer in the United States. And as a, maybe as a better way to sort of uh, express that, we can break it down if we look at a 10-year period. So this is from 2001 to 2011. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the average, average moviegoer is seeing 4.7 films per year. And for those 10 years, each year, there was an average of 19 franchise films made, and there was 130 foreign films made or distributed in the United States that year. Now, the frequency per capita is stark, in my opinion. So if there is a tendency to see about 1.3 of those 19 films, in this case, you have 0.04 in relation to, seeing, uh, in relation to a world of 130 films. So technically, out there, there's 130 films. Now, obviously, uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, many Americans are not seeing franchise films, one of them being just availability. But they're the, sort of the world of franchise films is not really being, uh, sorry, of foreign language films is not being frequented really at all. And the franchise films, in fact, uh, are getting a much larger share. Now, in relation to the assumption of figure one, this seems to actually counter that assumption of consumer sovereignty. In fact, major, uh, major filmed entertainment, or the Hollywood film business maybe in general, would say, my 19 films, my franchise films, are not in competition with these 130 films. I'm not losing sleep if I release The Avengers and I know for a fact that there's a Spanish or a German or an Indian film being released that same weekend. I'm not actually going to think that everyone's going to go see those films rather than seeing the Avengers. Because in this case, they've actually, there's actually not really a competition here. Because if you know the frequency of the habit, you may be able to say, well, you know, this isn't actually really this, the, a scary world of free choice, where anyone may actually see anything. So. Uh, with a better conceptual understanding why risk would figure prominently in a critique of the political economy of Hollywood, let us now start to provide more empirical evidence. So to maybe summarize what I've done so far, I've sort of maybe established that the sort of separation between power and risk is a problem. And if we sort of then have an idea that we need to actually think of those two things uh, maybe as two sides of the same coin, we are now left with the task of trying to measure it or to understand this empirically. So um, at this point, we can argue that major filmed entertainment wants to control the social relations of cinema. But aside from figures three and four, we do not yet know if they have been successful. So to start, we need to get a bit more technical about the capital capitalist power approach. So fundamental to Nitzan and Bickler's theory of capitalist power is the logic of capitalization. Capitalist earnings derive from the control of social creativity, and capitalization is a symbolic quantification of the ability to derive a stream of earnings from this control. Capitalization is an instrumental logic that is forward-looking in its orientation. Capitalization expresses the present value of an expected stream of future earnings. And since the earnings of the Hollywood film business depend on cinema and mass culture in general, we can say that the current fortunes of the Hollywood film business hinge on the future of cinema and mass culture. The ways in which pleasure is sublimated through mass culture and how these ways may evolve in the future have a bearing on the valuation of Hollywood's control of filmmaking. Thus, the major filmed entertainment firms of Hollywood discount expected future earnings to present prices according to their perception of the social historical state of pleasure. Now, just to give the, the briefest sort of explanation of the capitalization formula, some of you that have either uh, taken Jonathan's course or are currently taking John, Jonathan's course uh, may be familiar with this, but I'll just kind of go it over quickly and then just go right into maybe looking at uh, one aspect of this, which is risk. So capitalization at any given time, K, is equal to the discounted value of expected future earnings, EE, times hype. The numerator is discounted by two variables, the rate of return that capitalists feel they can confidently get, which is R subscript C, 
and the risk coefficient, which is the lowercase delta. Now, for those that may, have, um, may feel a bit overwhelmed with that already, if you're not familiar with this approach, uh, don't worry, because what we're just going to do now is to look just more specifically at risk. Now, the, probably the best way to look at risk, just as a, to start off with, is to ignore the two other elements, hype and the normal rate of return. And the reason that that's okay to do, it, uh, okay to do right now is that risk has a very important relationship with expected earnings, which is in the numerator. So expected earnings, by definition, is forward, are forward-looking. It's an it's a expectation of what earnings, a future stream of earnings, will be. So it's not present earnings, and it's not past earnings. So I guess, technically, you could obviously put any number in there whatsoever. You could say, I have an expectation of 400 million. I have an expectation of 3 trillion. Uh, you obviously have an ability to have any expectation that you want. Now, risk, which is the lowercase delta, is in the denominator. And what that, what that actually acts as is a way of actually weighing and, I guess, discounting those expectations. So importantly, risk is not a ex post after the event explanation for why a capitalist deserved a particular rate of return. In fact, because it relates to expected earnings, it actually is forward looking as well. And what I mean by that is risk is the expression of the degree of confidence capitalists have in their own predictions. So just as an example, what you have here is as confidence goes down, or as risk increases, as the lowercase delta increases, the same expectations of earnings, 200 million, is actually being discounted by a greater weight as the denominator increases, and you then get a lower capitalization. So if we have an idea of what we're trying to look at, if we're trying to look at the degree of confidence, or if we're trying to have an understanding of this lowercase delta, what we then can do is start with, I guess, a good starting point, a good empirical starting point. So this is figure five. Now, uh, before I sort of explain or uh, try to point out uh, what is going on here, I'll just kind of explain some of the technical details of this figure. So what this is, is the operating income per firm of major filmed entertainment. And what I'm trying to do here is to take volatility as a measure of risk. So what I do is I have the operating income per firm of major filmed entertainment from 1950 up until 2011. I then put it into a rate of change, but I put it into a five-year moving average rate of change to get, have more of a longer-term trend. And then from there, I take a 15-year moving standard deviation. Standard deviation measures the variance of the points in relation to the average of that grouping. So if your rate of change is very wild, and then all of a sudden the rate of change gets very, very tight, the standard deviation would be lower for that period where the rate of change is actually, in fact, much tighter. So this is actually trying to just look at the volatility of earnings, not the level. And figure five gives us a very good idea that overall, major filmed entertainment has reduced its risk from the mid-1950s to the present. More specifically, figure five has four important qualities, each of which can stand as an important historical point. First, the series suggests that risk was at its highest from the mid-1960s to the mid-1970s. And just as a reminder in that PBS documentary, that was, the, that was the era when many of the people in Hollywood were sort of looking back nostalgically saying, back in the day in the 60s and 70s, we made some really great films and it seemed that we were also making uh, both money and art. Second, the most precipitous fall in risk happened in the following period from around 1975 to 1980. And then you could say from the 80s to the present, there has been a steady decline in volatility in the earnings of major filmed entertainment. And finally, this figure five suggests that in all of the years for which data is available, the Hollywood film business is in its least risky stage. So where do we go from here? So to my mind, this is just an, an empirical starting point. I think it's a very interesting one. And it's obviously very helpful if I'm going to kind of move forward. But in my opinion, this decline in risk has to be explained. 
Now, in my dissertation, the plan is to explain how three aspects of contemporary Hollywood cinema contributed to this historical decline in risk. The three aspects are saturation booking, which I'm going to go over today, high concept, and what I am calling determined continuity, an idea which is indebted to the work of David Bordwell, who develops the idea of intensified continuity. Now, intensified continuity or determined continuity relates to the Hollywood style of filmmaking, uh, particularly with respect to its editing techniques and the way that a story is actually cut and, sh uh, and moves along shot by shot. So for today, what we're going to do is look at saturation booking. Saturation booking is a distribution exhibition strategy that gives a film a wide release by simultaneously exhibiting the film at as many theaters and on many screens as possible. Now, this is something uh, for many of us that we've uh, probably been just familiar with for as long as we can remember, and it's still going on today. So just the simple example that a blockbuster movie is more or less available to see on its opening weekend all across the country. Uh, before the 1970s, um, now, particularly before the movies uh, Billy Jack and Jaws and maybe a few others, this was not the case in Hollywood. But now it's something that we're all familiar with. So most importantly, saturation booking starts opening day, continues opening weekend, and remains in place as long as a film is popular in cities and towns all over the country. The wide release strategy is not simply designed to accumulate big revenues. Saturation booking tries to accumulate a film's revenues as quickly as possible. So just as a quick example, the 2001 film The Mummy Returns opened in 3,401 theaters and earned 90% of its revenues in its first five weeks. By contrast, in the same year, the Coen Brothers picture Oh Brother Where Art Thou opened in five theaters, eventually due to uh, you know, probably good critical reviews and maybe some buzz, eventually grew to a maximum of 847 theaters, but it took four months to earn 90% of its revenues. And its revenues were five times smaller than those of The Mummy Returns. Oh. Now, although saturation booking was instituted sector-wide in the 1970s, I would characterize the 1980s to the present as the era when major filmed entertainment looks to use the wide release strategy with greater effectiveness. And just to explain this with a simple visual, we have here a film project. So let's just say hypothetically that you're a studio executive and a script is put on your table where someone is sitting across from you and they're pitching a movie idea. You have a set of choices in front of you. Obviously, there's, I don't, wouldn't say it's the simplest choice, but there's always the option to just pass, to say no, to say this doesn't look like a movie that would be released in theaters, or maybe we'll put it in DVD release or something else, but I can pass on this. I know that I can say no to this. But let's just say that you actually say yes. You say this idea seems good. I think that this should actually get a theatrical release. You're then left with a choice. You can give it a limited release, which is uh, often what happens with independent films or what is sometimes considered to be uh, art house films or many of the movies that end up being nominated for Oscars. They're released, they're released in a few cities uh, at first, so in Chicago and LA and Toronto. There's a bit of buzz about it. There's some criticism. People start talking about it. And eventually, it sort of grows into uh, a larger thing. The other option is that you can look at that script and say, this is something set or perfect for saturation release. This is something that I want to release in as many theaters as possible on its opening weekend. I want it to be a big release from the start, and that's hopefully how it's going to go. So why is saturation booking so important? The choice between a wide release and a limited release cannot, in fact, be made lightly. Expectations about the future qualities of cinema, so that script that's sitting in front of you, they translate into expectations about earnings. Again, these earnings are not yet realized. You're sort of already starting to imagine what this movie will actually generate at the box office. And earnings about expectations, expectations about earnings, sorry, translate into a calculation about opening theaters. So here's just a simple hypothetical example. Let's say, again, you have that movie script in front of you, and you expect that in, a, in its first week, it's going to draw at least $100 million in revenues. 
if you, based on trends, know that in two years' time when the movie is actually in theaters, that the average ticket price is $5, you say to yourself, well, at least 20 million people, assuming one viewing per person, have to actually see this film. And that's a lot of people. So you already are starting to think about, well, how many theaters, how many screens, how many locations across the country? Now, if we understand the importance of saturation booking to the capitalization of cinema from the 1980s to the present, we are left with an empirical question. Is the Hollywood film business choosing the right set of films for the saturation booking strategy? Now remember, right in this sense refers to expected revenues, not about whether the film is in fact a good film or not. What we are trying to do is find supporting evidence about the major filmed entertainment's degree of confidence. So what I'm going to do now is go through figure six a bit slower so I can explain some of the steps that I took to make it. So there's figure six and there's also three tables. And if you bear with me, I'm going to go through some of the details so you sort of know what you're looking at when you're looking at figure six. So Historical data on opening theaters enables us to approximate the evolution of Hollywood's risk coefficient, which is the lowercase delta, which denotes the confidence the Hollywood film business has in its predictions about the future financial performance of cinema. This approach demonstrates that from 1981 to 2011, Hollywood has been able to improve its ability to predict the financial performance of its films. This increased predictability reflects a better understanding of, and perhaps a greater ability to shape popular culture. And this greater understanding and ability in turn translates into higher confidence, lower risk perception, and higher capitalization. Figure six uses opening theaters data to approximate the long-term trajectory of Hollywood's risk perceptions. Opening theaters stands as a proxy for future expectations because the decision about the size of opening theaters is made before a stream of box office revenues actually begins to flow. So even in the week leading up to a movie, and there's an idea that if you, you know, go on Box Office Mojo or Cineclock to see how many theaters or where you're going to be able to see the movie next week, there's already a decision that's been made about how many theaters this movie's going to be in in the next week. And then once Friday starts and once the doors open, then revenues actually start to flow. So decisions about what is a good release strategy for each film derive from financial expectations about what, will, about what will happen to each film on its opening weekend and onwards. Furthermore, as I suggested earlier, the Hollywood film business must try to confidently decide which films will receive wide theatrical releases. So on the idea that opening theaters is a proxy for future expectations, opening theaters data can be used to compare expected gross revenues and actual gross revenues. So take, for example, 1986. To get a sense of Hollywood cinema in 1986, one can go to a website like Box Office Mojo and reproduce Table 1, which is presented here in abridged format. This table ranks in descending order 1986 films in the first column by their domestic gross revenues in the second. So obviously, uh, we can see many films that we're actually quite familiar with. Top Gun, Crocodile D, Platoon. I mean, many of these films have gone on to be popular, in part because in 1986, they were the biggest movies of 1986. In addition, a third column shows the number of opening theaters for each film. Table 1 is interesting for a few reasons. What first stands out is Platoon, which opened in six theaters, but eventually went on to become the third highest grossing film of 1986. So this Oliver Stone's movie uh, would be a good example of a highly successful limited release. Uh, the second and perhaps more important point is that there is no one-to-one -one match between revenue rankings and opening theater rankings. So for example, already on this list, uh, the top two films, Top Gun and Crocodile Dundee, did not have the widest releases of that year. So we can already see even below, some of the movies that are below it had much bigger releases. Uh, now table two offers a different view of the same year. It sorts all of the films in 1986, not by revenues, but by opening theaters. And aside from two films, 
Back to School, and The Golden Child, none of the films in Table 2 appear in Table 1. The films in Table 2 had the widest releases in 1986, but only two of them were able to even reach the 50 million plateau. So, taken together, Tables 1 and 2 compare the top performing films, ranked by gross revenues, to what Hollywood expected the top performing films to be, ranked by opening theaters. Figure 1 extends this comparison over time. The figure contains three series. So just for the sake of easy reading, I'm just going to say revenues, theaters, and predictability. But in this case, I'm referring to these three series, top 10% revenues, top 10% theaters, and top 10% predictability. So um, the, figure, uh, the first series, revenues, measures for each year the US box office gross revenues of the top 10% of all films ranked by box office gross revenues comparable to table one. The revenue data are presented as a percent share of all box office revenues in the United States. The second series, theaters, measures for each year the US box office gross revenues of the top 10% of all films ranked by opening theaters, which is comparable to table two that looked at 1986 when sorted by opening theaters. Revenues demonstrates how the top tier of films has, over a 20 year period, increased its share of all US box office revenues. So if we look at 1981, it's floating somewhere around 41%. And up into 2007, it's hitting maybe its highest peak, around 75%. So the top 10% of all films in 2007 was grabbing the lion's share of all revenues for all movies of that year. What is more interesting for our purpose, however, is the relationship between revenues and theaters. From the mid-1990s onwards, their fluctuations grow increasingly correlated. Additionally, over time, the two series converge. This second observation is expressed with the third series, predictability. Predictability presents, from 1981 to 2011, the ratio of top 10% revenues to theaters. We can see that over time, one, the size of the ratio has decreased, getting closer and closer to one, and two, that the fluctuations in this ratio have lessened. So what does it mean when predictability is close to one? What it means is that technically, both revenues and theaters is counting more of the same films. In other words, when predictability is close to one, the highest grossing films were also more or less given the widest releases. Conceptually, the declining ratio and fluctuations of predictability suggest that Hollywood is getting better at predicting which movies will financially perform better than their cohorts. As the ratio approaches one, the top 10% of the films put up for wide release also end up being the top 10% in terms of gross revenues. So to think about it just with one more example, we can lo then look at 2007. So table three, uh, kind of in a bridged format, kind of takes the views of table one and two that looked at 1986. And in 2007, predictability, the ratio was at 1.089. So it was very close to one. And what that means of, out of a possible 63 films, 46 films were both in revenues and in the theaters uh, series. Now, what the table also demonstrates is that five films appear in both rankings for 2007. So in 1986, there was only two films that was common to both Table 1 and 2, which was Back to School and The Golden Child. In this case, you have five films. Again, this is just in, the, in an abridged form. And not only that, the same five films are in the top five of both tables, just in different order. So why is this significant? Well, the figure tells us that Hollywood is able to use the saturation booking strategy with a greater degree of confidence. Moreover, I would make the argument that this actually gives Hollywood, the Hollywood film business a better idea of how to control and shape social creativity with respect to filmmaking. So going back all the way to our beginning point when we started with sort of the neoclassical assumption of consumer sovereignty, in that sort of scenario, if someone came to you and said, I have this idea for a script, Essentially, the person sitting across from you has no idea whether it's going to be successful or not. So you make this movie, you say, 
I am making Spider-Man 3, and the person across from you says, well, that's great, but we really have no idea if Spider-Man 3 is going to be successful or not. Because consumers could go one way or another. They could see Spider-Man 3, but they also could go see some random movie at a local theater. This, in my opinion, gives a better idea of how they know, in fact, how to actually say yes to a movie or to say no to a movie. In this case, if you have something like Spider-Man 3, there is, yes, some variance. It was the number one movie ranked by revenues, and it was the third movie ranked by opening theaters, but that, re that variance is very small. So it's not, as Devaney said, something that is infinite. So in fact, I would make a guess that the person that is invested not the person, but a person that's invested in Spider-Man 3, is not losing sleep on the week before that Spider-Man 3 is released about whether, in fact, people will actually go see this movie. Now, what I'm, doing, what I'm working on currently, and this is just a work in progress, is sort of creating, I guess, what I'm calling a predictability index. So for what I presented was just the top 10%. Yeah, this is not in your chart book, so... Um, what I presented uh, today was the top 10%, but obviously, once I kind of develop a method, I can then kind of change the measurement. So this is the top 1%, the top 5%, and the top 10% kind of put together as a weighted average. And I don't know if it's necessarily the best way to go about doing it, but it is something that I'm working on, because when I first began, top 10% was, I guess, just a good number to start with, and it was something that I was curious about, but I didn't know from minute one that 10% is really the best way to look at this. So as this presentation went along, I moved from the general, the theoretical and conceptual, to the specific, to the empirical and technical, and even getting down to one example with saturation booking. So I think it's, in fact, best to conclude with some general remarks. So part of my dissertation will counter the conventional wisdom that Hollywood is a very risky business enterprise. Major filmed entertainment, as I see it, has devised strategies to limit and restrict social historical creation, reducing the possibility that the future of culture will be radically different from what capitalists expect it to be. This creation of order does not eliminate risk entirely. Rather, from the perspective of capitalization, the industrial art of filmmaking and the social world of mass culture can be made orderly enough for a film project to be weighable and calculable, where estimations about a film's social significance can be, with a degree of confidence, translated into expectations about future streams of income. Certain strategies affect risk perceptions as much as they affect earnings. The repetition of genres, sequels, and remakes, the cult of movie stars, the institution of false needs and wants through the sales efforts of business, the dual ability to make movies resonate with established desires and the ability to ready the industry of filmmaking for potential changes should, obviously, uh, should a new fad sort of take root that uh, the film business can actually say to directors and actors and everyone involved, look, this is the direction that we're going. These techniques help schematize the social relations of cinema by shaping culture into something that is regular and repeatable, almost like an automated machine, Social habits, attitudes, and values become things that can fit into a knowable, distribu knowable distribution, which can then be quantified as risk. Now, part of today's presentation was to demonstrate how major filmed entertainment has systematically increased its degree of confidence from 1960 to 2011. Since I have not covered all aspects of my research, let me conclude by making some quick gestures uh, I guess about other parts of my research or just kind of giving you an idea of where my research is going. So first with respect to theory, um, the defined limits of Hollywood cinema are not simply ideological. In fact, the many qualities of cinema, because they are purposely controlled, are capitalized. And this fact makes us rethink the relationship between ideology and capital accumulation. With respect to risk and ideology, I can quickly theorize through an example, and it's just one small example, so I don't think it sort of stands on its own, but it's just, I guess, more of a fun example. The 1987 film, Baby Boom. So this uh, is probably the type of movie that would make many of us groan, I've seen this movie a thousand times. I would, in fact, wager that many of us could write this movie. 
or not only that, looking at the poster alone, we already probably know where the narrative of this movie will go. So just to give you just a small sample, the IMDb synopsis, which I think is a, a great synopsis because they really know how to put kind of uh, it all down into one sentence, the life of super yuppie JC, played by Diane Keaton, is thrown into turmoil when she inherits a baby from a distant relative. So it seems like a very silly movie, uh, but we can probably already probably predict the arc of this movie. So here she is, super yuppie, probably living in New York, uh, clearly has no interest or kids or doesn't even want to have kids. And somehow through some crazy, I don't know, some legal loophole, she actually inherits a baby. And this inheritance of a baby obviously throws her life into turmoil. She wants it all, she wants to stay in New York, she wants to be big and successful, but this baby just for some reason is just dragging her down. So the movie, obviously then in the arc, is her starting to understand that she needs to compromise, that she needs to kind of internalize family values, most likely move outside of New York, and then sort of raise the kid uh, in, I guess, in more sort of balanced lifestyle. So the baby at the start of the movie was her antagonist, but obviously at the end of the movie, it is the, uh, the baby is the sort of the thing that she reconciles with. The child teaches her a lesson at the end of the movie. Now, that may seem just like a kind of a fun parlor trick, but Baby Boom is not, this critique of Baby Boom is not simply an ideological critique. In fact, there's another way to think about this, the fact that we already know what this movie is or where it's in fact going. In fact, our pre-knowledge of Baby Boom or even the tendency to consume problematic Hollywood films over and over and over with some sort of repeatability could actually be included in the risk perceptions of the capitalists themselves. So they may be able to say, we know that both the consumers and the filmmakers have a pessimistic, limited expectations about the potential of cinema. We all seem to accept that Hollywood isn't very good, like in the PBS interviews, but that in fact may be something that can actually then be capitalized, knowing that people that want to make films and people that want to, make fi want to watch films have the same expectation. So empirically, with just one more sort of looking forward, today's presentation does not cover all the elements. But the study of saturation booking gives us a clear picture of how major filmed entertainment has reduced risk. The next task at hand is to trace the overall performance of major filmed entertainment. To get an idea of what this means, we can quickly look at figure seven. And in light of time, I'm not really going to uh, sort of go over too much about figure seven, but it is uh, something that allows me to place an understanding of risk in relation to that formula that I showed earlier, which was capitalization. So figure seven helps us see how risk figures in the capitalization of major filmed entertainment. Both risk and market capitalization are presented as differentials. By that, I mean the risk and the market cap of major film entertainment are benchmark against what I am calling dominant capital 500, which is the top five 500 firms ranked by market capitalization. And I got access to the dominant capital 500 through CompuStat uh, mainly. And from there, you can download all the relevant data to construct some sort of index for dominant capital 500. Uh, just to then quickly sort of explain the differential by benchmarking it, you're actually then sort of looking at the movements of both risk and capitalization. So when, since major filmed entertainment is in the numerator, when differential capitalization is going up, market capitalization of major filmed entertainment is increasing at a faster rate than the market capitalization per firm of dominant capital 500. Similarly, with differential risk, or if you were to inverse it and call it a degree of confidence, the ratio of major filmed entertainment to dominant capital 500, the decrease in differential risk means that major filmed entertainment is decreasing its risk or increasing its degree of confidence at a faster rate than the average firm in dominant capital. So figure seven corroborates the argument we've been trying to develop today. The increase in the power of major filmed entertainment is expressed as a greater degree of confidence about the control of cinema.
Uh, I want to thank you very much for your time. And just to remind you that this series has its conclusion next week with uh, Troy, who's in the audience, is presenting on uh, De Beers, and he's titled it The Power of Love. It is in uh, this uh, room on Tuesday. So this was the only Wednesday uh, presentation. So I hope to all see you there. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. I'm just going to grab some water. Thank you so much, James, for an extremely uh, stimulating presentation. Um, now I'd like to Im invite the audience to offer uh, questions or comments. And uh, I implore you to speak directly in the mic so your questions are recorded for posterity. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, I know I've said it before, but it bears repeating. Figure six uh, is just a stunning, insightful piece of empirical work. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed by it every time I see it. Um, my question is on what I think is, is a bit of a theoretical leap that you make with regards to the, the sort of social control aspect of, of this. Couldn't another explanation for the convergence between the highest grossing films and the most widely released films, like an apologist might say, well, this is actually just, we're doing a better job uh, of reading people's desires. So for example, in you know 1986, we made a mistake. We thought people wanted Raw Deal when really they wanted Top Gun. Now by 2007, we do a really good job. We think people want Spider-Man 3, and yes, indeed, they want um, Spider-Man 3. So I'm wondering if you have any kind of uh, empirical evidence to argue for the other side of things that, in fact, this is actually just Hollywood shaping people's desires to fit um, their filmmaking. Uh, yeah, that is something that I'm thinking about, I think, more and more. I don't actually have currently something empirical to maybe sort of counter possibly this claim that we're just, we have, we're not really controlling, or not controlling, we're not really exercising power over the social relations of cinema, we're just now really good at listening to what people want. So people want Spider-Man, we're listening to the people and we're giving them what they want. Uh, the one, uh, so I, I would really think that it would be good if I could find some way to empirically investigate that. The one example that I can think that stands on the tip of my tongue right now is the film critic Jonathan Rosenbaum, who wrote a very interesting article about the Blair Witch Project and he made the argument that the sort of media hullabaloo about the Blair Witch Project was major filmed entertainment trying to pretend that they knew it all along. So if you actually track when the movie was released and then it kind of blew up all through word of mouth, everyone was saying, hey, you got to see this crazy horror film that was made for $60,000 on a Handycam. You got to go see this movie. It then got picked up in Time Magazine and a few others about two weeks later. But it was them sort of then trying to say, yeah, we knew it all along. Like we were sort of in touch with what people wanted. We know that people wanted horror films and this is what we already give you. I know it's not really the only example that will sort of put the nail in the coffin in that argument, but I do think that it's interesting. And it's something that, yes, I should empirically look at. Okay, I have a, a question with respect to figure seven, the last figure that you have. Maybe you can put it again on the overhead projector. So uh, like uh, with uh, last time that I made a comment, you should probably publish it very quickly so it's not uplifted by all the copycats. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, one technical question and another suggestion. Uh, I, I find this uh, stunning if it actually stands for what you claim it stands. Uh, I want you to, if you can, clarify exactly how you computed the differential risk. Is this uh, something to do with the previous chart or is this the respective volatilities? So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question, uh, is whether you uh, considered, instead of differential capitalization, using uh, the ratio of uh, price to earnings. Because essentially, 
uh, um, earnings also f affect capitalization. So capitalization, the differential capitalization could grow over time because um, major film entertainment have higher earnings. So you want to control that just to see the effect of risk. Uh, you can easily create the same chart, I think, with the price earning ratio. And uh, if the inverse correlation is stronger, uh, you are even uh, more strongly vindicated. So that's a suggestion. But uh, I would appreciate if you can clarify how you computed the differential risk. Sure. Uh, so going into it more technically, I, if you look at Figure five, which is the volatility of earnings. So in the volatility of earnings, this is essentially taking what just would be considered to be past volatility. It takes the earnings that are available, and you then uh, put it into a rate of change, and you measure a standard deviation as a way to start to maybe get a better sense of what, if I'm saying that risk is, in fact, also forward looking, much like expected earnings. What I do for differential risk, or what I'm just doing for the lowercase delta for both major film entertainment and uh, dominant capital 500, is actually plugging everything, all the other variables, into the capitalization formula. So I have market capitalization. I have the normal rate of return, which is the USA 10-year bond constant maturity yield. And for expected earnings, what I do is I take a long-term linear trend of earnings. So for a year, for example, let's say 1980. For 1980, the expected earnings for 1980 are the past earnings from 1960 all the way up until 1980. I take that as a linear trend, and then I forecast that into the future 10 years, and say that in 1980, the expected earnings are expectations about 1990, not about 1980. So it is a, it's, I guess my first, or I guess, yeah, I guess it's my first attempt to try to get an understanding of what expected earnings would in fact be in 1980 mm -hmm. or 1981 and so on. So then if I know expected earnings, I know market capitalization, and I know the normal rate of return, you actually can then isolate lowercase delta and plug everything else in. Now, to sort of make sure that I'm not doing something completely off, I then, uh, I don't have it here, but I then kind of put this up against my measurement of past volatility, which is just using the rate of change and the standard deviation. And then I then express a correlation to see if I'm actually on the right track. And yes, they both, they're not perfectly tight, but they do, they both move in the same direction. And I think the correlation coefficient is, I think, uh, 0.84, something like that. But again, I could be a bit wrong about that. So. Uh, somebody who is technical would say uh, you're using a residual, essentially. You are creating an indicator for risk by the leftover. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, if you compute uh, capitalization in one series and capitalization in the other series, then at least the capitalization element is going to create that correlation. So uh, I think uh, it, it would be nicer to have uh, an indicator of risk that is independent of capitalization to see the correlation between them. Right. And uh, the fact that you correlated the two is very, I think, is very insightful. And uh, I'd be really looking forward to see all those different variations of that. That that is a very powerful, I think, the very powerful description of the relationships because, in a way, it closes your argument. It uh, it brings the argument to uh, a conclusion. And I would then raise another question, if I may, because I still don't see enough hands <laughs> here. Uh, and that is, what's going to happen next? Because if the differential uh, risk is almost zero, <coughs> then that's more or less the end of the road for risk reduction for, for Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, w with respect to what happens next, the one part of that I have yet to actually do a presentation at all in my dissertation is just looking at the level of earnings. This is all looking at risk and the volatility of uh, the volatility of social habits or the volatility of earnings. So one of the things that I may sort of start to maybe speculate about is possibly where is this going with respect to how long can this, this sort of strategy continue on for. So the level of earnings measured differentially is in fact not increasing. It's actually stagnating. Uh, 
So the, the size of the profits is flatlining. Um, so I don't know where, in fact, it will go, and I don't think it would be maybe apt for me to make a prediction. But the sort of the strategy of constantly saying we need to actually uh, make as many blockbusters as can and stick to the formula. In fact, this year, with the, with, the, uh, with the disaster of the Lone Ranger, Disney actually announced that it's going to take even less risks when it comes to making or saying yes to movies. That even a movie like the, a big blockbuster like the Lone Ranger is too risky. And I don't even know what that means, because it seems that they're just now maybe just going to make or hope for the next Harry Potter series or something, and that's what they're going to go in for. I mean, they did buy Lucasfilm for $4 billion, so we now have three Star Wars movies coming down the pipes. Like The, the trend of blockbusters is continuing, but where is it going to go? I'm, I'm not sure. So this question is really just more out of um, idle curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I was just, I guess, thinking about uh, television. So for example, the Learning Channel and Discovery. I mean, how, w you know, their content has changed a lot over the past 20 years. So how would television networks assess risk? Would it be in a way that's even somewhat similar yeah, to I, major filmed entertainment? Yeah, I could say that it's somewhat similar in the sense that Again, none of this is, uh, you know, none of this is natural. This is all kind of, uh, this is all historical, or even you can say socially constructed. And by that I mean, risk isn't when it comes to understanding risk in television and movies. There's an assumption just to think that it has an inherent level of risk. That by making a movie, by making art, it is automatically risky because we think of art as something that is more creative or imaginative and. It's more risky than making chairs or, more, or making tables. But when it comes to decisions over even things like television shows, and the TLC is probably a great example, yeah, like it's sort of just going. Boo -boo, like yeah, it's the, this channel that calls itself the learning channel has essentially just gone into the toilet with respect to content. But when it comes to maybe something like risk, it's almost a self perpetuating cycle. So if we know that people like Honey Boo Boo, we also know that people will like Duck Dynasty. And we, like, we know that the, like, if we can kind of establish one and sort of carry it on, again, it doesn't mean that this is our, either our natural likes or this is the natural level of risk. In fact, is if we can create an environment, we can then have confidence about the environment that we created. So even going back to the start of my presentation with the picture of all the posters, that doesn't mean that those are the best posters that we all sort of love and that's the you know what pleases the human eye it may be more these posters seem to work maybe if we can actually repeat them over and over again and people don't notice that they're being repeated we actually have a, may have a bit more confidence about how to actually tell art designers what to do again not necessarily making it that that is the only way to do it clearly it's not so yeah i, I would say that television has some comparison but no i'm not really looking at it so hopefully that sort of helps Uh, I just have a question regarding mm -hmm. uh, franchise films. Mm -hmm. So if we look at figure three, and uh, we look at the number of films as a percent of total, so how many uh, franchise films are being created. And you s stated that there are not, there are not necessarily more franchise films being created. I think that levels off at about five. Yeah. Yet we see franchise films, uh, the attendance rate of franchise films increasing. And even um, figure two, 2007, you showed uh, the rank by box office cross revenue. You have Spider-Man 3, you have Shrek, Transformers, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Harry Potter. So my question is that why is it that um, Hollywood films are not creating more and more uh, franchise films uh, in order to, I guess, maximize profit? Uh, and, and because they are definitely seeing uh, a trajectory going upwards in, right. uh, in, t uh, in relation to attendance and uh, gross revenue. Well, I should say the, the one thing about that is that when I did it as a percent of total, the number of films as a percent of total, I did that for the reason in relation to um, figure, even figure one, where figure one gives you an idea that there's more choice. There's just more movies 
out there. And in fact, there are more movies released per year now, maybe not th than there's ever been, but at least since the 70s up until now, there's more movies released. Absolutely, like, I mean, not relatively like as a percent, but absolutely there are more franchise films. So in the 80s, there was, I think it's counting around 10 or 12, and now it's each year it's averaging about, oh yeah, I just had it up, it was averaging about 19 films a year. So there are more franchise films, okay. but the reason that I did it as a percent of total was to sort of establish that, yes, you may be in fact seeing one or two more franchise films out there, but as a percent of the total, it still hasn't really changed. Um, I do agree to one extent, in your, uh, maybe in your question, that there may be a, a new trend where, yes, franchises are now trying to maybe appeal to a whole bunch of interests that's not just uh, superhero movies or it's just not science fiction. There are a whole set of other franchise films because included, um, include, you could include in franchises a whole bunch of things. Uh, the Confessions of a Shopaholic, all sorts of other examples that could be classified as franchise films. Um, whether they would then make more, mm, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, it seems, at least to my eyes, that the strategy is to try to get people to still gravitate around one or two films, really. So something like Star Wars, will, if, if all goes well according to their eyes, it will be something that gets a lot of people there, not just a certain demographic. That Yes, it will include lots of teenagers that will see Star Wars, but it will hopefully try to reignite all of our past imaginations of what Star Wars used to be in the 70s and 80s, and it will sort of compel all of us to say, I need to go see Star Wars again, because I've already seen six of those films. Thanks, James. Um, your findings are truly stunning, and I agree. You should definitely try to publish this. Um, the one thing I was thinking about was um, if you want to shape people's desires and you want to shape ideology, obviously the channels, uh, the medium that you use to, to be able to do that really matters. So might not this also reflect kind of um, the shift in the kind of mass media that's being exploited by the industry? So that, for example, the internet becomes kind of an echo chamber um, that you can really exploit to great advantage. But that in that respect, it also kind of reflects uh, a broader kind of cultural malaise that the music industry is, is using as well, for example. Uh, and then I'm also thinking then it might even serve to one day undermine uh, their power over the market. So the rise of Netflix, I'm thinking, for example. And the second question I had was, um, do you have a sense of how you might generalize this beyond just the US? Uh, I'll first start with um, the last, I guess, technical question. Uh, empirically, studying the film business, uh, even the Hollywood film business outside of the US is quite difficult. Um, now, I, when it comes to uh, market capitalization and profits and things that you can find through CompuStat, I'm just dealing with uh, an aggregate of, of profits, so some of that is due to international sales or something of the like. But when it comes to maybe trying to understand theatrical attendance, even the international box office revenues, aside from having one big number for international box office revenues, I'm running into some problems with that. Uh, now, with respect to the thing about, uh, with respect to the internet, I, in fact, would agree that, and I don't think, um, we have yet to find someone interested in the capitalist power approach that is wanting to work on something like big data, but there's something really going on there. So your example with Netflix, Netflix openly admits of how much data they actually track on people that watch Netflix, and they, they sell it. They, they actually record how often you even pause a movie while you're watching one movie. So if they say, well, the person watching this movie pauses it six or seven times to go, in the bath to, go to the bathroom or I talk on a cell phone, somewhere someone can package that data and then sell that information to someone that's interested. And when it comes to even something like using Twitter or Facebook to constantly talk about films, that that is an available means to do data mining on, to actually see how many people are talking about your movie and even what they're saying about it. Um, sorry, can you maybe, I may be missing one part of your question, if you could 
Yeah, but I was just thinking that perhaps it's um, it's not just a reflection of, of the power of Hollywood, but that I'm not saying that the, the rise of social media is necessarily independent of Hollywood's right. power, but that in that respect, it's, it's kind of a broader phenomenon that relates to right. how everything is becoming kind of monocultural. Right. Oh, yeah. So y with respect to sort of the maybe you were comparing it to the malaise in the, right. in the music business. So, yeah, when I made the argument at the end that maybe there's a sort of general pessimism on both the filmmaker and the consumer, I think that that's, in fact, dialectical, that you can't, you know, you can, you can push for more pessimism, but when is that going to break? When is that actually going to inverse? How pessimistic will people get about Hollywood until they say, I'm not actually going to watch Hollywood films anymore. I'm actually going to make a conscious, maybe even political decision to watch a whole bunch of different set of films. Or I'm sick and tired of young filmmakers that try to mimic the Hollywood style. Maybe I'll make a movie that goes completely in a random, almost new di direction. I think that that sort of problem is dialectical, that I don't know where that sort of limit is of how sort of low can you push before people start to say, I don't want this anymore and I want something else. Uh, but I do think that that even theoretically is there, that you can't just sort of think that, I, I'm not trying to present my data saying, you know, they're just, they're pushing down expectations about cinema and they're just going to win and they're just going to get it to the bottom of the barrel. I mean, there are people that want good movies and there are people that want to make good movies. So maybe that will sort of reignite, maybe it will go in a whole bunch of directions. But I, I think that even with respect to music, there's something similar. People go out into the outskirts of music, they release their own stuff through band camp and all sorts of things and saying, I can do this myself. Uh, great presentation, James. Uh, one thing that jumps to mind with respect to uh, this tendency towards big releases, trying to make as much money early on, uh, I was thinking, the rise of information technology and how easy it has become to bootleg and, and uh, see movies online for free, illegally of course, but sometimes before they're even released. I'm wondering maybe you can comment on that, how that has affected perhaps uh, the rise of, 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 you call it the saturation releases. Right. Um, when it comes to piracy, I have yet to see a reason why I should include it in my section on risk. Uh, maybe there is a good reason why. But uh, the reason that I would say that there isn't a good reason to include it in something like risk is because kind of going off of Brian's comment, you can, tr with sort of even with the BitTorrent's own publications of what people are downloading, Hollywood can have an understanding of the volatility of piracy, more or less. It can come to some idea of who's pirating. And yes, some people just, that's all they do. So maybe even some people in this room don't pay for a single movie. But that, if that sort of kind of doesn't change, very much or doesn't change radically, that may have less of an impact on the volatility of all of this. Now, with respect to the level of earnings, that is something that I have yet to really kind of sink my teeth into. Uh, even with respect to big saturation re releases, the one thing that I would say is that, at least in my eyes, and I'm sure we all can um, see this as well, is that there is sort of a tendency lately to try to get people back into the theater. That dumping a lot of movie money into production values of particular movies, there's kind of a growing trend again to say, you really do need to see this in theater. Yes, you can download it on your computer. Yes, you can watch it on your iPhone. But you really should see it in the theater. And probably the biggest example right now is one that's still currently out, which is Gravity. Almost everyone that I've talked to about Gravity I haven't seen yet is telling me I should really see this in theater, and I should really see it in 3D. That if I download it or watch it on my uh, if I download it illegally and watch it on my laptop at home, I'm really not going to enjoy it in the way that I was meant to. And from what I understand, that the visuals are, in fact, quite impressive. And I'm sure some people in the audience who have seen Gravity could attest to that. So it's almost a sort of maybe counter. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Does your research ever look at production houses and the actual producers? Because if you know, they are very limited, like the producers are the same people over and over, right. and they're part of a very elite group that have the same ideas. So when it comes to risk, they're also associated to other corporations that could promote their, um, their movies. So when you're looking at taking on a script, you think, okay, it's not just about the story, right? It's not about just the risk of who's gonna go and whatnot, but it's how much you can plug it through 
TV channels, newspaper, right. magazine, and so on. So does your research ever look into that? Uh, I, it does, uh, I think, just often is supporting evidence. I think uh, I've uh, recently picked up a, a book called Not Hollywood, and it's an uh, anthropologist who just does a series of interviews with independent filmmakers and trying to understand their position within Hollywood film production and often asking them, what, you know, why do you see yourself at the margins? Why sometimes do you stay at the margins? So someone, um, oh, I'm just going to forget his name, oh, John Sayles, who uh, directed a few films, one of them, Matt One, who sort of kind of purposely stays outside of the inner, inner circle of Hollywood and says, I'll only do an independent production. I'll get the right of final cut, which is often the big debating point when it comes to making movies. Uh, it's something that I think I need to look in more. I mean, so I'm, maybe some of you are aware, but uh, for instance, even act, big name actors themselves open up their own production houses. So they're actually making a production deal with a major studio. So it's technically you know, Brad Pitt's company that is making World War Z. It's, I think it was Paramount that's distributing it, but it's kind of both sides of the same coin. They're kind of shaking hands and saying, let's make this movie. Uh, so in that case, it sort of makes it even a bit more daunting, maybe, to think of how you could act, someone could actually get into those circles without maybe sort of playing by some of those rules. Because I think you're correct in the sense when they look at some of these scripts, it's not just, is it a good movie? It's like, what is it going to be for uh, you know, kids that want t-shirts or want to play video games or all sorts of things? Not every movie is like that, but there's a lot of that going on, clearly. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, very interesting. Uh, uh, a couple questions. Um, one, uh, in your conceptualization of risk, uh, you've convincingly showed us something about theatrical revenues. And I wonder how you would conceptualize, as most historians of Hollywood would say, that the conglomerate structure has theatrical revenues as only one and, and maybe one of the smaller streams of revenue uh, to be considered uh, in relationship to marketing costs, uh, video games, toys, theme parks, on and on and on. Uh, so just if you could think about that in terms of your concept. Um, yeah, with respect to theatrical revenues, in, in one sense, Scott, uh, there, yeah, it's very, um, I think, well published in other books on the Hollywood film business that as a proportion of all revenues, theatrical revenues is, I think at this point, lower. Well, it's lower than all the others combined, but it's a bit bigger than maybe internet sales like iTunes, but it's smaller than DVD and Blu-ray. Now, with respect to that, I think, one, I've had real trouble trying to find any sort of even like remotely good financial data on DVD sales and video cassette sales. If anyone knows any sort of way to get any of that, I would uh, buy them dinner because uh, it's something that I think I really need to look into. The one thing that I think I could explain conceptually, though, why theatrical revenues or why figure six is still very important is that even in the PBS documentary, there's still an understanding that theatrical revenues or the, the, releasing a movie in theater is sort of the best way to start this long stream of things. It's still the tent pole. Even if it doesn't get the most revenues at the end of the day, having a movie in a theater, having a big phenomenon about a movie in a theater sort of gets the ball ro rolling for all of these things. So yes, it goes into a video game. Yes, it goes into DVD. Yes, it goes into Netflix eventually. But if you don't sort of have that big theatrical release, you know, maybe something like a video game just is off the table because you need sort of people to already know and love the movie. So uh, the second and third Matrix, the ma Matrix, the first Matrix was already out on DVD, but they were already sort of saying, yes, we have more movies, but we also have more video games. But that has almost everything to do with the buzz of the first movie. Yes, they're then making money in all sorts of different piles, but it's still the tentpole, at least as uh, I see it. Okay, if I could ask a, yeah, sure. another. Uh, the historical dimension, implicitly you're talking about what's sometimes thought of as the new Hollywood from the late 70s till now, compared implicitly to the, the transitional decades of the 60s and 70s, the volatile, risky artistically, uh, 
uh, rewarding to some uh, historians and filmmakers. Uh, do you have some sense of comparison to the historical dimension of, of classic Hollywood, the, the system itself, right. uh, which in some ways is the nostalgia for the, uh, the corporations, a, a system which was a vertically, horizontally oligopoly, I never can remember, yeah. can pronounce that, uh, and, and in fact was uh, enormously risk-free. Right. Uh, so is, is there some implicit historical comparison that, that you can develop in terms of ways in which contemporary uh, modes of distribution are imitating or inspired by saturation booking versus block booking, the studio systems version? Right. Are there, are there some aspects there that might be developed here? Uh, I think there are, and maybe just for the sake of time, I'll just go over just a few of the points. Uh, for those that are um, maybe uh, not familiar with the long history of the Hollywood film business, from about 1920 up until 1948, uh, as Scott was sort of talking about, there was a studio system where there was vertically integrated studios that had control over production, distribution, and exhibition. Now, with respect to risk, I unfortunately can't find any sort of data that can make any sort of figure, any of the figures like this for that time period. If again, if I could find that stuff, or if you can find that for me, I'll buy lunch. But um, what uh, I can do is sort of theoretically think about it with respect to the production code administration. The, the instance where due to a bunch of scandals and a bunch of bad publicity about early classical Hollywood in the 1930s, the Hollywood film business voluntarily self-censored self -censored itself with a what it called the production code. And it was literally a few sheets of paper that said what you can and cannot have in a movie. So when it comes to representations of sex, or representations of adultery, all sorts of um, aspects, this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. To my mind, that actually helps with risk because Hollywood themselves have a document that can say, we're sorry, we have to say yes to these movies, and we're sorry, we have to say no to these movies. We sort of already know what we can, in fact, already say yes and no to. And then with block booking, the instance where the Hollywood studio system was selling its films in blocks to ex exhibitors, and you couldn't actually get around it, you couldn't actually just buy one movie, that they had even a greater confidence of actually dumping their fare onto other exhibitors, that there was less of a risk that one of these movies would actually be unsuccessful. In fact, they may have purposely gone the other way, made some of these, they may have not have cared about some of these movies that they were in fact releasing. Other than that, and I, I guess I am sort of kind of glossing over some of the history, but other than that, yes, there's I think a theoretical link, but an empirical link is something that I would need to work on. Michael Lewis wrote uh, a book, uh, I think, called uh, Moneyball, in which he described how uh, in the sports business they have introduced sort of a, a fusion of a production function and a capitalization formula to decide uh, which players to recruit and which players to sell. Do you know if something like that is shaping in the way that movies are made? So what are the components of a movie that will eventually make it to the top 10 list of blockbuster releases? Uh, I'm not, I have yet to get an idea of how common it is, but there are some, uh, kind of like Michael Lewis, who's also a journalist, there are some examples of people reporting on firms that in fact provide that service. Uh, so Malcolm Gladwell did a piece for The New Yorker talking about a company called Epigogics, where a guy, he sort of, he has hired a whole bunch of script readers and they have what they call this, they call it a neurological database. I don't understand how that would work, but the article doesn't describe it, but they say we have this big database and we have these script readers and they read all of the scripts that are so, sort of submitted and they sort of give everything a point value. They then 
through historical research, they go into some older scripts and find out how successful or unsuccessful they were. And then it sort of outputs some sort of production function where they say, well, you have a scene where they go to another city. That will probably increase the value of your movie by 10 million. Or we, you have a scene where someone wears a purple hat. People like the color purple. That increases your uh, movie by 3 million. Uh, whether, in fact, any, anyone in Hollywood finds this impressive, I don't know, but there are a bunch of examples of firms like that. It was also reported in the New York Times. Uh, I forget the name of the company that the, the, the New York Times reported on, but his main argument was it was kind of it was a funny one. He kept going on and on about bowling, saying that never make a movie about bowling because it will never make money. And again, whether that's true or not is obviously again this isn't sort of like naturally determined. But it's them sort of saying, you know, we can analyze these things down to the, its smallest details, and we can capitalize whether the representation of bowling in film is profitable. And they say, no, it's not. Never film bowling. Uh, is, the, is there uh, a reason why not to explore that further? In other words, to go and have 10 interviews with people who uh, work in this business and figure out whether they use it and whether they think it's, it's a useful thing at what stage it is and so on. I think that that is uh, something that can uh, cut through the chase to a lot of what you're doing, right? Because they're mechanizing the process, and that would explain why they're so successful in in reducing risk. Yeah, I I, I definitely would agree on that. Uh, if it could possibly be some sort of post dissertation project, I think it would be really interesting. It would be really interesting. Uh, yeah, because the goal right now is, I think, to to, to cut to the chase in my own way, and then from there. Uh, but it is something that is, is I think, definitely interesting uh, to, th to explore further, because the articles, they're, they're entertaining in a certain way, because there's a particular form of madness when you read them, because they're looking at movies in a way that many of us would never look at a film. That they're trying to find the littlest details and trying to determine whether those littlest details have an effect on expected earnings. The ultimate victory of J.B. Clark. Yeah, yeah, and because then you can, and obviously there are some more, uh, less, you know, maybe bowling is a funny example, but the use of the star system is definitely a big one, which I think even Hollywood would agree that they in fact use. You have a script, and you're looking at it, and you say, yeah, this movie seems okay, maybe I'll release it, maybe I won't. Someone like Tom Cruise says, I want to be the main star. All of a sudden, you can then say, yes, we know that the expected revenues of this is going to go much higher. To what level? Who knows? But often, uh, the sort of recommendation, if you want to finance your own film in Hollywood, you need to see if anyone's actually going to be attached to this film. And if no one's attached to a movie, then it's almost uncapitalizable. Because if we can't even determine who the actors are, it may not actually really ever float. Just expanding on what you just mentioned, um, we, were sell we were selling a script to um, Hollywood in the States and in Canada. When we gave them the script, the producer read it and he said to us, why would I do a movie about Salvadorans? Nobody cares about Salvadorans. That was his feedback, straight up. Then we took it to Canada and Canadian filmmakers said, there are not enough Latinos in this country to empathize with the lead characters. If we get a big name starring, say, Selma Hayek, then maybe it'll be marketable. So that kind of worked. And then they said, but if you really want to make a great movie, do something about the Holocaust. Don't do a, the Civil War in El Salvador. Do the Holocaust. Everyone will go and see that. So that, that's where I mentioned to the, the fact that the producers are very elite, and they have a notion of history and what they think people want. And that has worked in the past, and they just reproduce and reproduce that. So. Um, I, I don't know this, this world very well, but it, it strikes me that film festivals are kind of growing in, in prominence, and we, we hear more and more about film festivals, and that they're loved by both Hollywood and kind of fans of auteur film. Um, and it strikes me that film festivals could be seen as a, as a way of externalizing risk. You have these independent productions, they've taken on all the risk, and now Hollywood is there ready to pounce if 
you know, this El Salvadoran film gets made and, oh, surprise, surprise, people do actually care, they want to see it, now, now we can jump on it. Yeah, I, I'm starting to look more into film festivals and I think it's definitely an important part because even going back to something like a film project, someone may say, well, you can make that movie yourself. You can somehow get money from a bank and you can film that movie yourself. If it then goes to TIFF and everyone writes about it, then obviously it's something that will, uh, may be picked up later on. The interesting thing about film festivals that I'm starting to learn is uh, the film critic that I mentioned earlier, Jonathan Rosenbaum, he, write, he writes all sorts of interesting stuff about the culture of film festivals because he sort of has a, I guess, a very cynical or critical view of film journalism itself. And he makes the argument that many film critics don't in fact actually love cinema, that they're, I don't want to say just paid journalists, but they're sort of doing this for, as a job and there may actually be very little love in it. And in fact, at film festivals, he makes the argument that in most cases, journalists are often pre-told by their editors where, in fact, to go. Don't, don't explore the festival yourself and sort of see whatever movies you want. If you already have an idea of a certain buzz of a movie, this is one that you should probably write about because this is the one that our, that our readers would, in fact, identify with more than other ones. Now, the question of which movies to go to at a film festival or which movies should the journalists go to he also writes about the sort of the explosion of Harvey Weinstein and Miramax. So Miramax is in a certain way the kind of the most successful old independent film distributor that has now been taken up by Disney, but Miramax has released and still does release many foreign films or even releases I guess a number of independent films. But Rosenbaum talks about how Harvey Weinstein himself kind of a lot of reportage about film festivals is about whether what Harvey Weinstein thinks. So it's not even reporting about the movies, it's what does Harvey Weinstein think about the movie that we just saw? Because he's one of the big people that will say, I like this, this is the movie that Miramax is gonna go for, and this is the one that we're gonna promote. He's also been known to be quite, uh, I guess, aggressive at the Cannes Film Festival, because he constantly makes the argument that the Cannes fin Film Festival is not American enough that when the jury at Cannes votes or sort of nominates a set of other films that may be outside of Miramax's wheelhouse, he actually then starts to say that, you know, I'm kind of sick of this, I'm sick of this film festival. It's not, you know, it's going off possibly into an unknown world that Brian, in fact, was talking about. People are maybe making other movies. I should say, though, I am not really familiar too much with the film business of other countries, so I don't want to sort of make, give the illusion that outside of Hollywood, other countries just have small, independent, uh, critically-minded fare. There's obviously a whole set of other businesses that I don't study. Thank you.